Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for part one of our series, Hyperspectral Data for Land and Coastal Systems. My name is Amber McCollum, and I will be joined my, by my colleagues, Juan Torres Perez and Zach Benston, throughout this training. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with our RCEP program, we are part of NASA's capacity building program under Applied Sciences and are designed to empower the global community through remote sensing training. We have a variety of training types with these four application areas, air quality, water resources, disasters, and eco forecasting, which is where our team resides. Our training levels are on the spectrum from introductory all the way to advanced trainings with guides for remote sensing analysis. This series is on the introductory level. Our trainings are designed for professionals within natural resource management agencies, policy makers, and other environmental decision makers. For this training, we will have three sessions, each being one and a half hours long on January 19th today, the 26th and February 2nd. The same material will be presented twice per day to help with participation from folks in different parts of the world. Note that you only need to attend one session per day and you can find all the uh, materials for the course at the website listed here. There is only one prerequisite for this training an understanding of the basics of remote sensing with our course on those concepts listed here. Also, um, here's the website again where you can find the lecture materials, a link to watch the session recordings after the live sessions, and eventually a link to the homework. For this series, we will have one homework assignment the link to the homework will be made available during the last session and will be due on Tuesday, February 16th. The homework will be completed via Google Forms and you'll submit this all online. If you attend all the sessions and complete the homework by the deadline, you will receive a certificate of completion. And please be patient as it does take a few months to um, complete these certificates and send them to all of our participants. As I mentioned, this series will consist of three sessions. During this first session, you will be provided with a general overview of hyperspectral data. Then in the subsequent sessions, we will review applications of hyperspectral data for land applications and coastal and ocean systems. And in the second and third sessions, we will also have a demonstration of accessing data. Here are the learning objectives for the first session. You will learn how to recognize hyperspectral data and how it differs from multispectral data, identify current hyperspectral sensors, and future hyperspectral satellite missions of interest. And finally, you'll be able to locate available hyperspectral data and identify data processing platforms. I also want to mention that at the end of the lecture portion today, we will have plenty of time for question and answers. So please do type your questions into the chat box along the way, and we will um, categorize all of those and get to as many questions at the end. If we don't get to all of the questions um, during our session, you can also email myself or my colleague, Juan Torres Perez, and our email addresses were shown on a previous slide and we'll show them at the end as well. Okay, so let's start off with a really basic overview of hyperspectral data. With hyperspectral remote sensing, we will be speaking mostly about the visible and infrared portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Surface reflectance at different parts of the spectrum or wavelengths are used to identify 
properties on the Earth's surface. This variation in the reflectance of wavelengths is what allows us to differentiate features such as land cover types or water quality parameters. So in this schematic, you can see the sizes of different waveforms along the electromagnetic spectrum. And for optical remote sensing, which is mostly what we'll be focusing on here, we generally use wavelengths from the infrared to the visible range. As a review, optical sensors use the energy from the sun and record the reflected radiation from various surfaces on the ground. Reflectance occurs along the electromagnetic spectrum and the sensor picks up the reflected energy along various wavelength intervals. Thus, the spectral resolution is the ability of a sensor to define wavelength intervals. And the wavelength intervals can be wide, which means they cover a larger range of frequencies, or narrow, which means they cover a small range of frequencies. Each band or wavelength range represents a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the finer the spectral resolution, the narrower the wavelength range for a particular channel or band. So you may be familiar with multispectral imagers such as Landsat. These measure the radiation reflected from a surface at a few wide separated wavelength bands. In the figure on the right, um, with the gray, you can see those wavelength ranges. With Landsat 8, for example, band 5, or the near-infrared band, has a wavelength range of 850 to 880 nanometers. So the range is 30 nanometers. Most hyperspectral imagers, on the other hand, measure reflected radiation at a series of narrow and contiguous wavelength bands. So the wavelength range for a hyperspectral sensor may only be five nanometers instead of 30. When we look at a spectrum for one pixel in a hyperspectral image, it looks very much like the spectrum that would be measured in a spectroscopy laboratory. This type of detailed pixel spectrum can provide much more information about the surface than a multi-spectral um, pixel. So then, what really is hyperspectral remote sensing? So this is the acquisition of images in use of contiguous registered spectral bands. Although most hyperspectral sensors measure hundreds of wavelengths, it's not the number of measured wavelengths that defines a sensor as hyperspectral. Rather, it's the narrowness and contiguous nature of measurements. Essentially, hyperspectral data is characterized by many bands and measuring reflectance at close intervals along the electromagnetic spectrum to better characterize spectral signatures and reflectance of land cover, water, and the atmosphere. Hyperspectral imagery especially refers to data captured with bands spaced 10 nanometers or less from one another. So here's another comparison figure of the multispectral imagery on the left and the hyperspectral imagery on the right. When we think of something like Landsat, we have 11 bands and three in the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So when we look at the reflectance from each of these wavelengths, we essentially only have three pieces of information like these three bar graphs that you can see here on the left. But when we examine hyperspectral data, we have hundreds of bands within just the visible portion of the spectrum and at other wavelengths. So we can obtain a much more detailed picture, like a time series of reflectance in these many bands across the electromagnetic spectrum. This 
to differentiate subtle differences on the ground that may not be available with my multispectral data. So here is another schematic that really illustrates the usefulness of hyperspectral data. On the top is an example of a multispectral sensor. Again, we can think of Landsat. And on the bottom is an example of a hyperspectral sensor. This outlines the wide and narrow wavelength ranges in the multispectral versus hyperspectral sensors. Notice how closely spaced the bands of the hyperspectral sensor are. The narrow bands of the hyperspectral sensor give us a lot more information to use. Much of the data currently available to the public is multispectral. So as I discussed, these are sensors like Landsat with a limited number of bands, and these usually have relatively high resolution and are usually global. Hyperspectral data, on the other hand, has the advantage of the increased spectral resolution. However, hyperspectral data sources are currently limited. A number of hyperspectral missions are ongoing and planned, but these data are not yet freely available over the same spatial scale as multispectral data, which we will discuss in much more detail um, later on in the lecture. So with hyperspectral attributes in mind, you can now identify why spectral resolution is really important. When we have a lot of those narrow bands, we obtain a level of spectral detail that might go unnoticed in a multispectral sensor. For example, you can see here uh, four spectral signatures, pine woods in purple, grasslands in green, sand in black, and silty water in red. While you may be able to distinguish water from grasslands with a multispectral sensor, it might be difficult to distinguish different vegetation types from one another, such as the pinewood versus the grasslands. Because as you can see here, they are spectrally very similar. But with a hyperspectral sensor, you could clearly identify some of those differences in the pine woods versus the grasslands. Because of this unique ability to identify many different spectral reflectance values across these narrow bands, there are many applications of hyperspectral data. And these include things like geology, invasive species, coastal and ocean monitoring, carbon monitoring, analyzing microbial life in the Arctic and volcanic activity. And there are many more actually. In this image, you can see how hyperspectral data can be used to distinguish different types of coral in order to conduct a, a robust classification. Here's another example of the ability of hyperspectral data to distinguish between different minerals. Just as iron and copper look different in visible light, iron and copper rich minerals reflect varying amounts of light in the infrared spectrum. So this graph compares the reflectance of hematite, an iron ore in blue, with malachite in green, and cryoscola, the copper rich minerals in red, from 200 to 3000 nanometers. So you can clearly see some of these differences. Okay, so now that we have um, given you a brief review of what hyperspectral data are and why they're useful, let's move on to discussing some specific hyperspectral sensors. There are multiple satellite-based sensors, and these include EO1 Hyperion, which was a very popular system, and two test missions on board the International Space Station, or the ISS. These are the Hyperspectral Imager for the Coastal Ocean, or HICO, and the Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiometer Experiment on Space Station, or EcoStress. 
There are others that are flown on airplanes. And these include the Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer, or AVRIS, which has been flown throughout the world, and PRISM on board the Coral Reef Airborne Laboratory, or CORAL. And we'll discuss each of these specifically. So Hyperion is one of the most popular hyperspectral satellite systems. And it was launched in November of 2000 and was decommissioned in 2017. The Earth Observing One, or EO-1 satellite, was launched on November 21st, 2000, as a one-year technology demonstration validation mission. After the initial technology mission was completed, NASA and the USGS agreed to the continuation of the EO-1 program as an extended mission. It collected 220 unique spectral channels ranging from 357 to um, 2,576 nanometers with a um, 10 nanometer bandwidth. It had a spatial resolution of 30 meters for all the bands, and the standard scene width was 7.7 um, .7 kilometers, so actually a very pretty narrow strip. And the standard scene length is 42 kilometers, with an, the option to increase the scene length to 185 kilometers. So in these images here, um, this long strip that you can see is an image of Mount Fuji from 2000. And the image on the bottom gives you an example, again, of how different the Hyperion spectral range is from the Landsat um, bands, for example. So you can see that within only a couple Landsat bands, there uh, are higher spectral resolution there with Hyperion. Some of the Hyperion data has been processed and archived, so you will need to check in on some of the data portals of how you can access these data, and we'll also um, be speaking about that later today, as well as during our second session. One use of Hyperion is for mapping mineral deposits. Here, the hundreds of bands in the hyperspectral imagery enable researchers to differentiate minerals and rocks that appear similar in visible light. So these images are of outcrops at a mining site in Jordan, where you can see the minerals are uniformly dark in the natural color image along the top and are um, in the false color image on the bottom. So here you can identify um, different rock types for um, mining activities or for um, just geologic mapping in general. The next satellite hyperspectral sensor is the hyperspectral imager for the coastal ocean or HICO. HICO was the first space-borne imaging spectrometer designed to sample the coastal ocean. It was flown on board the space station and was used to sample a specific coastal region at 90 meters uh, spatial resolution with spectral coverage from 380 to 960 nanometers. So for HICO, the bands were sampled at every 5.7 nanometers. This sensor has a very high signal to noise ratio that is needed to resolve the complexity of the coastal ocean. As a demonstrative instrument, HICO was designed to collect only one 50 by 200 kilometer scene per orbit. The regions to be collected were determined weekly by a scheduling team. The focus was on providing HICO data for scientific research on coastal zones and other regions throughout the world. HICO demonstrates coastal products including water clarity, bottom types, bathymetry, and onshore vegetation maps. During its five years in operation, HICO collected over 10 
vaccines from around the world. This is an example of Heiko data where the animation was produced from a scene in the archive collected over Bermuda on August 17, 2013. Cycles through all 128 Heiko channels, displaying three at a time. The slider on the right shows which channels were used for the red, green, and blue comparisons. No additional processing of the um, top of atmosphere radiances or the level one data were performed to um, make these images. So here you can really see how different bands highlight the various components of the island ecosystem from land to shallow water to even the coral components. A newer satellite mission called the Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiation Experiment on the Space Station, or more commonly known as EcoStress, is also on board the ISS and measures the temperature of plants to better understand how much water plants need and how they respond to stress. While the optical portion of the sensor is multispectral, the thermal data and mission deployment will be used to benefit future hyperspectral missions as well. EcoStress was launched on June 29, 2018, and is still in operation. It has the viewing swath width of around 384 kilometers and views the surface of the Earth from a, around 53 degrees north to 53 degrees south latitude with variable revisit times. And this is really dependent on um, the orbit of the ISS. Images are acquired over the continental US and over key biomes around the world, including European and South Asian agriculture and selected FluxNet validation sites. EcoStress uses a multispectral thermal infrared radiometer to capture radiance of the Earth's surface in five spectral bands with one shortwave infrared band, data at about 70 meters spatial resolution. On May 15, 2019, following mass storage unit anomalies, a new data acquisition strategy was implemented for acquiring these bands. I also want to mention that we had a previous lightning session on EcoStress eco last year, um, in 20, uh, actually in 2019, late in the year. And you can find that on the RSET website. There, so there's a lot more information to be had about EcoStress there. Just mentioning one application here of EcoStress, it is oftentimes used for monitoring drought. The Western United States has been in drought conditions that have extended from the summer and into the fall of 2020. EcoStress imaged the drought on October 16, 2020 and compared the same area to an image from EcoStress taken a year earlier. The images on the left zoom into Arizona and New Mexico border um, along the Navajo Nation. And this features the EcoStress Evaporative Stress Index, or ESI, which shows plant water stress. The inset image on the right zooms further into the region, showing circular agricultural fields that have been irrigated. The blue colors represent low stress and high water use whereas the red colors represent high stress and low water use. Irrigation is able to alleviate plant water stress in many of the fields, while the surrounding landscape suffers from the drought. So the bottom image then shows the percent change in plant water stress from 2019 to 2020, which really highlights these um, differences. Okay, so moving on to some of the airborne sensors. The Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer, or AVRIS, 
has been flown on four aircraft platforms. The NASA's ER-2 jet, uh, the Twin Otter, the Scaled Composites Proteus, and NASA's WB-57. Avris has flown in North America, Europe, portions of South America, and Argentina. Avris collects data at 224 contiguous spectral bands with wavelengths from 400 to 2,500 nanometers. And each band is about 10 nanometers in width. The main objective of Avris was to identify, measure, and monitor constituents of the Earth's surface and atmosphere over a variety of landscapes. Research with Avris is predominantly focused on understanding processes related to the global environment and also climate change. Here's an example of the use of Avris data to monitor forest health. The hemlock woolly adelgid is a serious pest of Eastern and Carolina hemlock in the United States. To inform management activities and to it test the applicability of landscape scale remote sensing to monitor hemlock conditions, the hyperspectral collections of Avaris were conducted um, alongside concurrent ground truthing in 2001 and 2012. And the hemlock conditions were compared with field metrics that spanned a 10-year survey in the, the Catskills of um, New York. So this map shows the predicted decline in hemlock in 2012 using the Avris data. The results from this study also indicated that there has been an increase in hemlock decline and mortality, but the decline is slow. So that with other long-term monitoring studies and with the spatial information provided here, continued management strategies can focus on a particular area to help control the further decline of hemlock in this region. Another airborne platform is the Coral Reef Airborne Laboratory, or CORAL, which was a three-year mission from 2016 to 2019. CORAL acquired airborne data using the Portable Remote Imaging Spectrometer, or PRISM, and this instrument was installed in a commercial airplane Gulfstream. The goal of CORAL was to provide critical data and new models needed to analyze the status of coral reefs and to predict their future. CORAL provided the most extensive picture to date of the condition of large portion of the world's coral reefs in a really uniform data set. The spectral resolution is from 349.9 to 1,053.5 nanometers, and it had bands sampled at 3.5 nanometers. In 2016 and 2017, coral flew over key reef areas in the Pacific Ocean, including Hawaii, the, Mar the Mariana Islands, Palau, and the Great Barrier Reef. In situ data were obtained to validate the remote observations. For each reef, the spectral image was processed to provide a reef condition and was described by measurable quantities of benthic coral, excuse me, uh, measurable quantities of benthic cover of coral, algae, and sand, primary productivity, and calcification. These reef condition parameters were analyzed quantitatively against 10 key biophysical parameters using new models to understand reef conditions today and predict reef conditions in the future. So here you can see these study sites and one of the classified images created from the um, campaign in Hawaii. So you can see the classification here with coral, algae, and sand. Here is a table of a few other hyperspectral imagers 
that have been in orbit or that are slated to launch in the near future. The first is Taingong-1, which is, was in operation from 2011 to 2013 and was primarily used for land imaging over China. I do not believe these data are freely available. The second shown here is PRISM, is PRISMA, or the hyperspectral precursor of the application mission. And this was funded by the Italian Space Agency. This combines a hyperspectral sensor with a medium resolution panchromatic camera. In particular, the imaging spectrometer takes images with a pixel size of 30 meters in a continuum of spectral bands ranging from about 400 to 2500 nanometers. Next is Haisui, a Japanese space system, which is slated to also be on board the ISS. This project will verify its usefulness in various applications, such as oil resource exploration, and will be used to evaluate the potential of the instrument design for future mission. Next is NMAP, which is also scheduled to launch in 2021, and this is a German system with similar spectral and spatial resolution as some of the other sensors. Then we have Shalom, which is a joint mission between Italy and the Israel Space Agency, and that's planned for launch in 2022. And finally, the hyperspectral X imagery, which is a French mission focused on soil, urban, and coastal applications. So you can see there is a lot in the works in terms of hyperspectral data. There are also a few upcoming NASA hyperspectral initiatives that will benefit from um, these various previous airborne campaigns. The first here is the Plankton Aerosol Cloud and Ocean Ecosystem, or PACE. And this mission will focus on the global oceans, the atmosphere, and terrestrial systems. It is still in mission development, but it will be designed to take data from the ultraviolet to the shortwave infrared regions with bands sampled at every 2.5 nanometers. The next tier is the Surface Biology and Geology, or SBG, mission, which has many application areas of focus. Prior to the planning for SBG, under the directive of the Decadal Survey, the Hyperspectral Infrared Imager, or HISPRI mission, concept activity occurred from 2007 to 2018. And HISPERI had flights in Hawaii and California for 13 mission concept projects. This concept work was also vital to the development of the technology of EcoStress, which we mentioned earlier. HISPERI campaigns demonstrated the feasibility for applications of these data for things like global terrestrial ecosystem composition and function, fires, agriculture, and many others. The primary focus now is on the development of the SBG with this knowledge base. The final upcoming NASA hyperspectral mission I wanted to mention here is the Geosynchronous Littoral Imaging and Monitoring Radiometer, or GLIMMER. This is a mission like EcoStress that has been approved as part of NASA's Earth Venture Instrument Portfolio. And these are small targeted science investigations that complement NASA's larger Earth observing satellite missions. This initiative was led by principal investigator Joseph Salisbury at the University of New Hampshire, Durham. And Glimmer will focus on providing unique observations of ocean biology, chemistry, and ecology in the Gulf of Mex Mexico, portions of the southeastern United States coastline and the Amazon River Plume. So a little bit more information about PACE, which will collect hyperspectrometry and multi-angle polymetry and is currently scheduled to launch around 2023. PACE will extend key systematic ocean color, aerosol, and cloud climate data records. PACE will reveal the diversity of organisms fueling marine food webs 
and observe how ecosystems respond to a changing climate. PACE is composed of three instruments, a hyperspectral imager being built in-house at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and this is called the Ocean Color Instrument, and two other contributed multi-angle polymeters, HARP-2 from the University of Maryland and SPX-1 from a consortium of organizations in the Netherlands um, as well. The PACE Ocean Color Instrument, or OCI, will provide hyperspectral observation of the global oceans, atmosphere, and terrestrial ecology every two days at one kilometer spatial resolution at NADAR. OCI will observe from the ultraviolet through the visible and into the shortwave infrared, specifically at 340 to 890 nanometers, sampled at every 2.5 nanometers with a five nanometer resolution. HARP-2 will have a wide swath with four spectral bands across the visible and near-infrared spectrum. And SPX-1 will have a narrow swath with five viewing angles. So all three instruments will provide complementary data and will improve upon the collective understanding of Earth as a system of systems. PACE data will support five of NASA's applied research areas including monitor, monitoring air quality and health, water resources, climate, ecological forecasting, and disasters. The PACE Applications Program engages with applied scientists to support innovative uses of PACE data and to complement and improve decision-making activities and provide practical solutions. So please stay tuned for updates um, on PACE and be sure to check out the website listed on the previous slide for how to get involved. The SBG mission is also in the earlier stages of development and was selected under the guidance of the 2018 Decadal Survey. The specifics are still under development, but they are considering hyperspectral and thermal data. Listed here are some of the potential parameters the architecture team is considering for visible to shortwave infrared data as well as thermal data, such as a spectral range of 350 or 400 to 2500 nanometers, with the spectral resolution of 10 nanometers or better, with global data at 2 to 16 day revisit times. For the thermal bands, the range will be somewhere between 300 to 1200 nanometers with more than five bands and a revisit time of between one to 70 days. The SBG team is currently identifying and characterizing a diverse set of architectures and conducting performance and cost effectiveness studies. The potential SBG applications include vegetation, aquatic systems, snow and ice, active geological surface changes, change detection, and natural resource management. This figure really highlights some of these possible applications and what the imagery could look like. The community building for SBG is ongoing and the team is always looking for early adopters of the data, even within the professional management communities. There are many opportunities to become engaged, including a community workshop to be held on February 18th and another again in July. And these are free and open for anyone to attend. However, it will be capped at a certain number of participants. So this is a great place to become and stay engaged with this upcoming mission. So do please check out uh, this website here for more on um, news and events uh, associated with SBG. Here you can also be added to the email distribution list. So the final section for today is to briefly discuss how to access and process the hyperspectral data. There are many places where you can access hyperspectral data, in particular those data made available by NASA and hosted by the USGS. These include the USGS Earth Explorer, 
Glovis, NASA Earth Data, as well as Google Earth Engine. For each of the data portals, you'll need an account to download data, but you can create an account for free. If you have worked with multi-spectral NASA data, these portals are probably pretty familiar to you. Data are also available through the USGS Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or LPDAC. Here you can search for data depending on the application area, such as land processes or ocean biology. Here you can find Avris, Pico, Coral, and other hyperspectral data sets through the online resources of the DACs. In the next two sessions, we'll be providing demonstrations of how to access and view the hyperspectral data for land and coastal systems. So do um, stay tuned for more information about that. Although there are various sources of hyperspectral data available, these data are much less widely available compared to other satellite products. The spatial extent of data is particularly limited when it comes to airborne missions and pilot or proof of concept missions, which there's been quite a few of so far. The airborne data are limited to flight paths set by mission goals. For example, the NASA Coral mission focused its flight campaign on key reef areas in specific uh, island regions. The Avris land data is also available through various campaigns, but these scenes are limited by flight path and temporal resolution. These data will also likely be limited uh, in the future uh, for any uh, flight missions that may have been grounded due to COVID-19. Data from satellite tests and proof of concept missions is also limited by the study area priority oftentimes. So even if the sensor is capturing information over a larger spatial scale, um, those data might not be available in your region or globally. While some data acquired from these flights are not accessible from the NASA DACs, in some instances you can find assistance accessing data from the mission scientists as well. So it's quite different when we think about these data compared to the data of Landsat and MODIS, some of our most familiar satellites. Um, there are some really unique limitations in terms of data availability that you need to consider. Another thing to consider is that hyperspectral data are made available at different processing levels. And these levels vary with respect to data acquisition and the sensors. In the case of Avris, there are levels 0, 1, and 2. The level 0 data is captured directly from the sensor. The level 1 data represents sensor radiance, whereas level 2 data is in the form of surface reflectance. In pre-processing, hyperspectral remote sensing data must be calibrated for systematic hardware defects and atmospheric effects in order to extract reliable information. To process and analyze these images, it's important to diminish the dimensions of the data while conserving the important information, especially because these data files can be so large Therefore, there are some more advanced techniques, such as principal component analysis, that can be used to identify correlation among spectrally similar bands in order to choose the best bands for your study area. Due to the high spectral resolution, there can also be quite a lot of noise in the data. So something like the minimum noise fraction technique can be used to reduce this. And we will not cover any of these techniques in detail. I just wanted to mention them here um, if you are interested in actually using the data yourself. And the data can be processed in many different geospatial software systems, similar to hyperspectral, similar to multispectral data in some ways. Um, so you can actually open these imagery images and take a look at them in things like ArcGIS, QGIS, NV. 
Airdos Imagine, Google Earth Engine, and even in R and Python. And this image here shows an example of Landsat data on the top left, and then various bands of Hyperion data on the other panels of the image. Um, and this is shown in something very similar to um, these geospatial uh, software systems. So due to the data specifics, there are some really important considerations to take into account when you're conducting data processing. The two primary considerations are very large data files that often contain hundreds of bands and the spectral similarity of some of these bands because they're imaging so close together along the electromagnetic spectrum. So there's a real benefit to having these many, many bands but then these bands, because they're so narrow and close together, might be very similar. Um, so it might be difficult to decide which bands to use under certain situations. Also, you may need some additional computing power and storage. And you may need to really determine which bands are the most appropriate. And um, remember those two techniques I mentioned for selecting the correct bands and for dealing with the signal to noise issue. So this image here gives an example of the usefulness of, of removing some of that noise in the hyperspectral image prior to conducting the classification. So in summary, hyperspectral data generally has hundreds of contiguous spectral bands these bands measure reflectance at close intervals along the electromagnetic spectrum. The bands are usually spaced about 10 nanometers or less apart from one another. There are multiple satellite and airborne sensors that we talked about today, such as Hyperion, Avris, et cetera. And as you can see, there are many more in the works. So this is really an area um, that will be expanding in the future. Um, so it's a great area to be starting to get involved with. When using hyperspectral data, there are some really important considerations. The benefits are the ability to differentiate different vegetation types, um, as well as minerals, drought indicators, etc. But there are limitations in terms of the data set um, can be very large, and there is the potential for large signal-to-noise ratio, and the data are usually regional and not available globally. In the next two sessions, we will focus more on applications and case studies using hyperspectral data for land and coastal systems. So you can really get a, an idea of what these data have been used for in the past, what they could be used for in the future, and then we will also have um, two short demonstrations in sessions two and three on um, accessing and um, visualizing the hyperspectral data as well. So stay tuned for that. So I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And now we will move into the question and answer, answer portion of this session. Thanks again, everyone, for being with us today. We have a lot of questions. Um, I'm so excited to, um, to hear all these questions from you all. We have over a 1,000 folks online right now. And um, this is our first time ever teaching a hyperspectral training. Um, so I can imagine uh, there are a lot of questions because it is a unique data set. Um, so we do have time. We will get through as many questions as we can, um, as many questions as I can answer. And um, what you're seeing now is a question and answer session document where we have brought over many of the questions that you all have asked in um, the Q&A today. And I did want to mention that we will make this Q&A document available 
within about a week after each session. So we've included a lot of links here um, to some papers and more information. So you'll be able to access this Q&A document at a later date. Um, so do please check back for that as well. Um, I also wanted to mention, uh, we do often get a lot of questions about the homework and the homework will be available during the last session. Um, so it won't be available for another couple of weeks, but you will have two weeks to complete that homework and it will be a Google form that you can fill out directly online. Um, okay, great. So we will go ahead and jump right into the Q&A here. If we don't get to your question today, um, we might cover it in the next two sessions, um, but you can also email um, us at our email addresses shown here. And again, we, we will keep this included on the Q&A document for your reference as well. Okay, jumping right in. The first question is, is it possible to measure nitrate concentrations in the agricultural fields from hyperspectral imagery? This is a really uh, great question. Um, it's not something I was familiar with, but um, I don't believe that hyperspectral data can be used to measure nitrogen directly, but it, it can measure chlorophyll really well. And the chlorophyll concentrations can be used as a proxy for nitrogen con concentrations in many different um, agricultural crops. Um, and so uh, here's an, a little excerpt from an abstract from one study that measured nitrogen deficiency um, using the correlation uh, with the uh, cotton leaf chlorophyll. And so you could see they um, measured chlorophyll at um, 807.6 nanometers um, it's very specific because it, they had the hyperspectral data there and um, use that correlation analysis to identify deficiency in nitrogen. Uh, there's another link to a paper uh, that identifies uh, research that was done monitoring soil nitrogen with ground-based data and hyperspectral data. And um, this was done in apple orchards. And I'm not sure how successful this research was, but you can... Um, Take a look at that link there for more information. Um, question two, we had a lot of questions about EcoStress and I'll go through them here, um, but we do include the link to the link eco, to the EcoStress lightning session that we had um, a little over a year ago now. Um, so do please uh, watch that recording for more information. It's about an hour long session and we have uh, researchers who were involved in the mission concept, as well as a guest speaker from the LPDAC that talks about how to access data and display the, those data. So um, we'll include that link here, but do please check that out for, for more info on EcoStress. The question is, what does the asterisk on EcoStress mean? And we included EcoStress because it's this very unique sensor, um, but it's the uh, the optical portion of EcoStress is not really considered a hyperspectral sensor. It's considered a multispectral sensor. And we included it because um, it has been used uh, to identify uh, features for mission deployment that will be used to benefit hyperspectral missions as well. Um, so it's really useful in that way. So we included a little asterisk there um, because we don't see the, you know, 200 plus bands of uh, optical uh, data from EcoStress, but it is really important um, as a precursor to many of these larger missions that NASA is developing that may be on board the ISS or um, may be uh, similarly designed. So, okay, question three. Can hyperspectral data be used for crop monitoring and crop type classification? If yes, please explain how. And yes, that is one of the prominent uh, applications of hyperspectral imagery. We are going to cover that extensively in our case study example for next week. It's actually the first case study example that we provide um, for a very large study that was done over um, many different crop types in the US. 
and um, the hyperspectral data was used to differentiate um, various peaks in within the um, uh, with different ranges, wavelength ranges for these uh, different crop types. So uh, stay tuned and uh, come back with us next week, and we'll talk much more about about that example. <clears throat> okay, the next question. Are hyperspectral data available via Google Earth Engine? The answer to that is yes. There are a limited amount of hyperspectral data available, um, primarily from EO1 Hyperion at a limited spatial coverage. Uh, so we'll talk about Hyperion a lot through this series. It's uh, one of the most prominent hyperspectral sensors. Um, and uh, we've also noted here that you can access hyperspectral data from NASA and the USGS portals, and then you can add it to Google Earth Engine as an asset. So if you're familiar with that, you can um, use the data within the Google Earth Engine tools. Um, also want to mention that um, the developers of Earth Engine are constantly updating their um, data collections. And if you become a uh, if you if you register for an account, I believe you can access some user forums where you can vote on data that you want included in Earth Engine. And um, and I don't know how the process works behind the scenes, but I think if certain data types get many many votes, they may consider including um, those data within their collections. Um, so I know we have done it for some other type of data that we're, we've been interested in using. I also want to mention that during sessions two and three of this training, we will have demonstrations on how to access data, hyperspectral data. And uh, we will also, our next training that we hope to provide will be specifically on land applications using Google Earth Engine. So do please check back in a few months on the RSET website for uh, that training as well. We're really excited. It's a, it's a great tool. Okay, question five. One constraint on multispectral bands are the atmospheric windows where the signal can or can't get through. The curves shown for hyperspectral seem to ignore those windows. Is hyperspectral also subject to those constraints? Yes, actually, hyperspectral data are still subject to the constraints of atmospheric windows. Um, we, we cover atmospheric windows in our, um, introduction to remote sensing training and um, also uh, any kind of optical data are subjected to those atmospheric windows so these are essentially areas within the electromagnetic spectrum that allow the sensors to pick up data that allow the um, the reflected energy to pass through the atmosphere and be collected by the sensor and there are certain uh, portions within the electromagnetic spectrum um, where that doesn't occur very readily. But thankfully, uh, mostly for the um, visible and near-infrared wavelengths, um, those atmospheric windows are there. But yes, um, I also provided a, a nice short explanation of what an atmospheric window is there on the um, Q&A as well. Okay. Next question, six, is HICO data available for India and is it available to researchers? Uh, HICO data, as we mentioned, um, is only available for certain coastal areas, um, but it is available for some coastal areas in India. Um, it's readily available through, through the NASA Ocean Color Web uh, data access platform. And as I mentioned, uh, the next two sessions, the, the second session will cover land applications, the third session will cover ocean applications, and we'll actually be doing a demonstration on how to access um, data in session three, um, going over the uh, NASA Ocean Color Web and talking a little bit more about HIGO data, I believe. So stay tuned. Okay, question seven. How are clouds removed in hyperspectral images? 
so clouds are an issue in much the same way they are for any kind of optical remote sensing. Um, so this is an issue with multispectral data like Landsat, uh, MODIS, the, the very common ones that you all know. Um, so clouds have to be removed. Um, there are techniques such as cloud masking that could be used to remove those pixels. Um, as we'll, we'll discuss during the demonstration, we, we generally recommend when you're searching for data to use a threshold of about 20% cloud cover um, because you're really not going to be able to use those, those scenes in which clouds are very predominantly present, at least with optical data. You'll need something um, like radar data to penetrate those clouds. Um, so we have that same issue here with hyperspectral data. Okay, question eight. Uh, oh, uh, this is a great question. So what did you use to make the HICO visualization with the um, RGB slider? And that, that could be a really useful teaching tool. We love that animation too. Uh, we included the link there to the, um, the Heiko animation, and this was created by the team, uh, the ocean color team at NASA Goddard. Um, so we can't take credit for that one, <laughs> even though it's very, uh, very cool. So we've included the link to that visualization. It also has a little bit more information of how that was created on that website there. Okay, uh, question nine. My question is, are there rays emitted by different remote sensing satellites harmful for delicate coral reefs during the scan? No, so um, with all kinds of passive optical remote sensing data, there is no energy being emitted onto the ground. The only thing that those sensors are collecting are reflected imagery from the, the whatever uh, feature we have on the ground. Um, so there's no uh, harm that could be done to coral reefs because the only data we're obtaining are the reflected wavelengths that the coral is emitting as it, it, it's um, living. So uh, great. Okay, question 10. Uh, and here's a few eco stress questions. I think this is probably while we were going over the EcoStress slides. Um, but does EcoStress have information for South America? Uh, there are a couple locations uh, where EcoStress data are available in South America. There's this great website uh, within the EcoStress site that's a map of where data are collected. As we mentioned, EcoStress is on board the International Space Station and it only, uh, collects data at very specific targets. Um, most of those targets are aligned with some kind of ground-based network um, that had been in place when they were developing the sensor. So you could check out that map for the locations of those data. And this was, again, a um, shorter mission um, that's still in operation, but on board the ISS um, was only planned for a short period of time, but um, we're going to keep it going for as long as we can because it has some really useful data. Question 11. Eco stress is hyperspectral or thermal? Is it affected by cloud cover? So this is similar to the question that we had previously. It essentially has multispectral optical data and thermal data. And yes, it is still affected by cloud cover. Any kind of optical sensor is going to be affected uh, by cloud cover. Um, and we've also included the link to the um, infor very uh, specific technical information about EcoStress. And um, on that website, it has the uh, different bands of EcoStress and their, their wavelength ranges. So you can see all that information there. Um, question 12, can EcoStress measure soil moisture? EcoStress was primarily designed, and, and as far as I understand it, is being used for evapotranspiration, or ET, um, not necessarily soil moisture. Um, the SMAP sensor 
The soil moisture active passive sensor is, is another one that can be used for mapping soil moisture. It, um, it is a little bit more coarse in resolution, um, but that's another one to check out if you're interested in soil moisture. And then here I've included the link to the lightning session for EcoStress because I know uh, we had a lot of questions about that. It, it is a very, um, very cool instrument. It has a lot of inf uh, useful information, so. Okay, question 13. What kind of research is done with HICO? Great question. So HICO was designed for coastal ecosystem applications. Um, it's been used a lot for coral reef analysis and shallow water coastal ecosystem. Um, this is another sensor on board the ISS, the International Space Station. And again, with many of these smaller um, sort of missions, they're designed for particular use. And that particular use and region um, was, was mostly based on, on the needs of the user. And uh, that's why the, the data are limited primarily to regions, coral reef regions. Um, and again, we'll, we'll discuss this in more depth during session three as well. We'll come back and talk about HICO again. Question 14 is a really great quest question that I think came through before we got to the end of the um, training where we talked a little bit about this. Um, so the question is, the large number and contiguous uh, spectral bands in a hyperspectral system cause redundant spectral information between neighboring bands. How to decide which bands are more relevant for a particular application? That's a really great question and um, is very specific to the application that you are interested in. Um, because the bands are so closely spaced together, there's often a high amount of correlation among those bands that are next to one another within the electromagnetic spectrum. So there are many techniques for um, disaggregating those correlations. Um, principal component analysis is probably the primary one um, where uh, they you can identify, essentially identify the correlation among the bands. And so what you would need to decide as the user of the data um, is which bands are relevant for whatever application I'm interested in. So if, for, for example, you had two bands that are highly correlated, you, um, you might decide which of those bands is presenting you with more useful information. Um, is there higher reflectance in one or the other band in um, the target that you're interested in viewing? And does that provide any additional information for you? Um, that type of analysis is beyond the scope of this training. This is really just an introductory training to introduce you to the data. Um, but there's a lot of research out there that's been done on, on PCA. Um, also, um, in on a related note, because of this high spectral resolution, there can be a lot of noise in the data as well. Um, so your signal to noise ratio um, can can be uh, can really affect the ability to use those data. Um, so the minimum noise fraction is one technique that can be used to reduce the level of noise in the data. Um, many of these techniques need to be uh, applied on uh, some sort of geospatial uh, processing software that is not freely available, such as NV. Um, so do keep that in mind, um, but that's a great question. Yeah, okay. Question 15, can hyperspectral be used to de determine bathymetry? Uh, yes, in some cases. Uh, again, we'll talk about this during session three, but um, it can be used to analyze bathymetry in shallow water. Um, shallow, clear water. <laughs> um, and uh, here's a paper, we've listed a paper uh, that used uh, hyperspectral data in Australia to estimate bathymetry. Um, and it is limited because uh, of the uh, very 
um, complicated interactions that that data have with water and with the um, surface uh, properties of um, say a lake or ocean. Um, so we'll talk about that much more on, on session three, but uh, I would say yes in a limited capacity. <laughs> so question 16, um, good question. <laughs> yeah, if hy hyperspectral data is so granular and valuable, why are emissions not operating at scale? Are the costs too high? So there are a lot of factors that we we mentioned in the training um, that contribute to the uh, inability of uh, global hyperspectral missions to take place. Um, yes, the costs are high. The data sets are very large. So if you have 220 bands of optical data um, at 30 meter spatial resolution, you can imagine that those data sets are huge um, and storing and cataloging those takes a lot of effort um, and resources. Um, and also the data are more difficult to process and analyze. Um, it's, a, it's a heavier lift for somebody who is just getting started with remote sensing um, to analyze and process Hyperion data versus analyzing and processing Landsat data. Um, so there are, there are many factors that come into play, um, but you will notice that we mentioned three new um, satellite missions that are in the works, uh, PACE, SBG, and Glimmer. Um, and uh, those will, at least PACE and SBG, I believe, will be global. Um, so so th there's interest out there. And um, the need has been recognized through the decadal survey. And um, we're working on it. <laughs> but it's a great question. Um, and you can get involved in those efforts as well um, as they develop those instruments and get those launched. OK. Next question, is Prisma um, data freely available? If yes, where can I find it? Um, the data were recently made available, and I believe uh, Prisma data are available uh, via the um, Italian Space Agency. And um, there's an article, an, an article on the SBG website actually that talks about the release of Prisma data. And um, there's a website we've we've listed there as well. I do believe you need to uh, register or maybe fill out some forms to access those data. Um, but but it seems like those are now freely available. Okay. Next question, 18. Is PACE five meters spatial resolution? Oh. So the, the, I think the confusion there is between spectral and spatial resolution. So PACE has five nanometer spectral resolution. So that means that the bands are spaced five nanometers apart, um, but the spatial resolution is one kilometer. Um, and uh, the other sensors within PACE will, um, oh, so that was for um, the ocean color instrument, which is, one we mentioned. Um, there are other sensors have different spectral and spatial resolutions. And we've included the, um, the link to details on PACE there as well. Yeah, five meter spatial resolution would be quite, quite great, but um, very difficult to achieve. <laughs> okay, question 19. Uh, what is the maximum limit and how of the number of bands in hyperspectral. Actually, is there a limit? Yes. If yes, what does it depend on? So the number of bands is, is going to really depend on how closely spaced the bands are together, so their spectral resolution, and the wavelength range that the data cover. So um, we discussed this a little bit more in depth during the first part of the, the session, but um, I've not seen more than about 220 bands. Um, so there's there's definitely a limit if you um, are looking at a particular wavelength range. 
Generally, um, the hyperspectral data are available in the visible and near infrared. Um, some of them, I believe, maybe go into the shortwave infrared, but it really just depends on um, how far apart those are spaced. But I'm not sure if there's if there's if there's any sensors that have more than 220. That that sort of seems like the limit I've seen. Okay. Question 20. In the Himalayan mountain vegetated cover area, can we differentiate sedimentary rocks through hyperspectral imagery? That's a good question. So the data are optical, um, as we've discussed. So optical remote sensing data only acquires information that's reflected from the top of the ground surface. So if you have vegetation covering rock, you will only get the spectral reflectance from the vegetation. Um, in order to assess different rock types, it would need to be bare ground. Um, so, so that's the, um, the limitation there. Um, you're, not, um, you're not getting anything penetrating through vegetation. Question 21, which data are and will be freely available? Good question. Um, so there are uh, multiple different online platforms and um, various data are available or uh, freely available. So Heiko, Coral, Avris, EO1, Hyperion are all available online. Um, NASA data are always going to be uh, freely available. Um, in some cases, there, there may be a registration process or request for access to those data. Um, data from those sensors that we mentioned are um, available on the NASA Ocean Color Web, uh, NASA Earth Data, Earth Explorer, and some other um, data access platforms. And again, we'll talk about this in more depth in the next two sessions. Um, but it's a great question because uh, many of the um, uh, airborne campaigns, um, the data are not um, easily accessible in some in some cases, um, but all the NASA data are, are available through the various websites we mentioned. Uh, question 22, for SBG, when you see it launched, thermal bands, what would be the spatial resolution? I don't think that's been decided. Um, I suggest becoming involved with the SBG applications community. There is another event coming up in early February, and we've included the link to the SBG website in the um, presentation materials. Um, so do do get involved with that. But um, we they I think they have a range for uh, the spectral resolution. But I don't think they and the um, temporal resolution, but I don't think they've clearly identified what the spatial resolution will be. I could be wrong on that, but um, do please check the SBG website. Um, the, the mission is still in development, so I don't think all of these uh, features have been totally decided. OK, moving on to question 23. Three. Uh, thank you. You've said that hyperspectral remote sensor captures more than three visible bands, RBG, as compared to three RBG for multispectral. Can you elaborate more on this? Yeah, so we talked about this quite a bit during the beginning of the session. Um, the benefit of hyperspectral data are the uh, is the ability to uh, monitor spectral reflectance among a contiguous uh, uh, wavelength range uh, with many, many bands. So a multispectral sensor, for example, um, might have uh, 10 bands within the visible and uh, near-infrared portion whereas a hyperspectral sensor would have 200 bands. And I'm just throwing out some number, relative numbers here. Um, but that allows 
the sensor to capture more of the uh, variability within the um, within the electromagnetic spectrum. So you might, for example, when you're looking at Landsat, you will get one value within the green range. Um, whereas if you're using a hyperspectral sensor, you might have uh, 20 bands within the green range or uh, you know, near infrared range. And that's going to allow you to distinguish very subtle differences in reflectance from whatever target it is that you are analyzing. Yeah. Tw question 24 is really interesting and I it's something I had not thought of before. Um, have there been any initiatives to uh, observe plastic waste and plastic litter in water and on the surface of the soil? Um, I do believe there's been some work uh, looking at plastic pollution in the oceans using hyperspectral data, and we included a link to one article there. Um, but I'm not sure how extensive this, this research area um, is in terms of the use of hyperspectral data. Um, it's not an area I'm very familiar with, but a really great question, and I think a useful application. And Amber, this is one I can elaborate a little bit more. Oh, great. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Um, um, so in the during the uh, coastal webinar that we did uh, last year, we covered some of, uh, and during session three in particular, we covered some of the, the uses uh, of uh, remote sensing for uh, marine debris. Uh, and um, there hasn't been that many so far, that many uh, papers out there using uh, particularly satellite-based or airborne-based uh, data, hyperspectral hyper data for for uh, marine debris or plastic litter, as uh, the question says in this case. But people have used uh, uh, spectro, uh, spectrohadiometers, field spectrohadiometers, to separate different types of uh, plastic or plastics or just you know marine debris uh, in in coastal and, and, and areas in particular. Uh, that uh, just to use them as a as a baseline uh, for constructing a spectral library to eventually use that library uh, with uh, satellite or airborne images. So there, so uh, we encourage uh, I encourage the, the 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 person who did this question to go back to our coastal webinar uh, session three in particular, and we covered some of this. And there's a there's a thing and a couple of papers that we also mentioned uh, on this regard. Thanks, Amber. Thank you, Juan. Appreciate that. Yeah, feel free to jump in at any point. <laughs> I'm not providing all the information needed, so that's great. Um, you are the, the ocean resident expert here. OK, uh, a few more questions. Uh, we have about eight more minutes for questions, so we'll get to as many more as we can here in this session. Uh, the next question, um, why does the hyperspectral data come with medium core spatial resolution? While I was mapping urban land use and land cover, uh, it was very difficult to identify land classes using a 30 meter pixel size. Um, how would you be able to map vegetation or urban features accurately um, unless you want to map something for a broader scale? That's a great question, and um, that really goes back to the way in which these missions are designed. There is always a trade-off between uh, spatial, temporal, and spectral resolution. So when um, the engineers are designing these systems, they have to make some decisions on um, what they can provide. Um, there's no there's no system out there that can provide um, very high spectral, spatial, and temporal resolution all together. Um, so, so with uh, Hyperion, that was sort of a trade-off that was made. Um, and and 30 meters, you're you're right, is it's difficult to identify small features on the ground. Um, and I would suggest using different types of of data. Um, so there, there are other commercial satellites available. 
um, that may have an increased spatial resolution. Um, also, uh, NASA, as it is designed as a public service, cannot compete with commercial uh, businesses who are uh, creating satellite systems that may have higher spatial resolution. So there's also a limitation there with how um, how far NASA can go in terms of providing really high spatial resolution data. Um, other data that might be useful are drone data, which you can um, fly on your own. Um, and there are a lot of researchers out there who are using drone information. Um, however, much of the drone data are multispectral, RGB and sometimes near infrared or red edge with the, the drone um, data as well. So you just have to take all of that into consideration when um, deciding on the data that you're using and uh, for what application you're using. Um, there's always gonna be a trade-off there, but it's a great question. Um, question 26. To my knowledge, NV is one powerful image processing for hyperspectral data, but it's not free. Uh, what are free but powerful image processing software for hyperspectral data? That's a great question. Um, one of the reasons why in sessions two and three, we're, we're going to be using, um, well, QGIS for, for session two for sure. Um, because yes, NV is a commercial software. Um, Airdos Imagine is another commercial software that is not free, that is often used for um, more advanced remote sensing applications. We will show um, NASA CDES, which um, is another free option to use. We'll be showing that one in part three. So we'll be showing QGIS in part two, CDES in part three, um, but it, it, there really are some limitations, particularly with hyperspectral data, um, because most of the hyperspectral data need to be processed to a, a level um, by the user. Um, most of those data are not processed to spectral reflectance, um, as you can obtain with something like your Landsat and MODIS and VIRS. Um, so that does require the user to conduct this extra layer of processing that generally needs to be done in a commercial remote sensing software. Um, there are some um, there are some exceptions, um, but that that is another um, really important limitation to consider. Question 27, sort of similar. Atmospheric correction must be applied even if it's level two data. Level two data are generally atmospheric correct, atmospherically corrected and are surface reflectance. However, many of the data available via hyperspectral sensors are only pre-processed to level one. So that's where you get the radiance values. And as I mentioned, um, you as the user would need to go through that, that additional step. And that's not something we'll cover in this training. Um, but that is that is one limitation to consider. Not a whole lot of the hyperspectral data have been processed to level two um, that I'm aware with aware of. So, um, question 28: Can a master student be part of Pace, SBG, and Glimmer? Certainly. Um, one of the reasons why we we wanted to highlight the upcoming missions is to to get folks involved. Um, so certainly, um, we've included a couple links there for how to get involved in, in um, those missions. Um, and this includes researchers. This includes um, applied users. Uh, it includes uh, a wide community. And uh, I think it's a really great thing um, that NASA has been doing um, in a higher capacity is including the the users of the data in the mission development. And I think it's a really valuable part of um, mission development. So, yes. <laughs> Next question. Okay, let's maybe take two more and then we'll be done. 
uh, as we're approaching the end of the session here. So the question 29 is, considering the limitations in accessing hyperspectral data, what factors should one consider uh, to access hyperspectral data for a particular study area? Um, Malawi, South Africa. So the first step is to uh, identify the extent of these missions. When you're searching for data, um, you can uh, search for spatial, you can search based on a spatial extent in many of the data portals, and we'll show you this in Earth Explorer. But um, what you could do is identify your study region as a rectangular area or even a uh, point of latitude and longitude. And then you can see what data are available there. Um, I think that's probably the easiest approach. Uh, or you can go to specific missions websites to see where those data are. But I, but I think if you just go to one of the primary data portals like Earth Explorer, which is what we um, will will demonstrate next week, you can always filter by area. Okay, the last question, and then um, what we'll do is we'll go through and answer the the remaining questions. Um, outside of this time and post them online. So the last question we'll have today, I'm curious about Avarice data applications. Um, can you please cover more elaborately and also help me learn about providing more information? So yeah, Avarice uh, has been used for air quality and wildfire smoke assessment applications. Um, and this allows for the differentiation of different airborne pollutants that can capture uh, uh, specific pollutants tied to those types of events. Um, I'm not sure if our health, so within RSET, we're the land and ecological forecasting team. We also have a health and air quality team. And um, so I would I would check out the other trainings that are conducted by our health and air quality team to see if they've covered any examples of avarice. I'm not sure if they have. Um, I will also mention that we are planning a wildfire training sometime this year that will cover, that we, we will have um, scientists within these different application areas coming together to, to cover sort of the full gamut of wildfire applications. and and um, smoke will be included, um, pollution will be included in that. So I'm not sure if we'll cover uh, Avarice in particular, but our um, health and air quality team, we will definitely cover uh, smoke events tied to different types of wildfires. So do please check back within the next few months if you're interested in that training as well. All right, everyone. Um, so thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and for all your really great questions. We will get to and try to answer the remaining questions that you've provided here on this document. We will post this document within about a week or so um, after each session. You can email myself or my colleagues, Juan and Zach here with our email addresses listed if you'd like more information um, or if your question didn't quite get answered, but we will post these. Um, for access later on. So thanks again. Do please join us next week at the same time where we will cover more case study examples of land applications of hyperspectral data and do a, a really nice uh, demonstration of how to access some of these data. So um, thank you again. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and we will see you next week.